Welcome to the Starting Over Podcast. I'm your host, Edward Sheldon, a.k.a. Dark Logos, and this is the show where we look at the strategies, tactics, and mechanics behind the game of Hero Clicks. All right, uh, today we got uh, a pretty decent show. I'm going to answer some stuff from Malcolm Rush, and uh, then we're going to sort of take it from there. Uh, I'm probably going to talk a little bit about Rebirth and the implications thereof, uh, but yeah, that's about it. All right, uh, let's look at it. He, has, he sent me some color questions. I think you may have heard some of these on, on other podcasts. Uh, but I think uh, we, we might be able to, to keep this rolling. Uh, so first off, he asked me to uh, rank all color powers worst to best. And uh, why would you choose that order? Uh, I, I'll, I'll do the, uh, the top five in my head. Or the top five. Uh, I think the, the best power right now in the game is prob um uh, above anything else right now prob is just proving to be invaluable uh no matter you know what team you're running even if you're running a team that sort of just plinks people prob is still important to defend yourself uh the next uh biggest power that i think is really shaping the meta more than people want to admit is shape change even more than perplex uh, people having to build in contingencies for shape change is at, I think, an, an all-time high. And, and most people um, aren't really realizing how much shape change has influenced the game in the last, like, six to eight months. Uh, so after shape change, I would do perplex because stat mods seem to be uh, the, the big rage definitely when you get a ton of free attacks uh, after that I, I know this is going to sound weird uh, super senses um, I, I think we're seeing an abundance of super senses characters come in and sort of disrupt things uh, because you just have a chance to miss and sort of stacking that with also shape change is is a huge deal uh <laughs> The, the last power that I'm going to mention is a power in which I didn't think I would say is that influential um, until looking at the gamescape. Uh, and it's sort of funny because it's a little bit more classic. And, and uh, I would say that stealth, um, there are a ton of characters that don't see through stealth. And when you start taking that into effect, stealth, is a very solid defense in the game. It's not, you know, unquestionable, uh, but it is a a valid defense for uh, being an influential power right now. So now what we're we're dealing with is I, I feel a a game that is a lot more focused on having and resolving for. Uh, a variety of defensive and yeah I, I would just say like defensive and odd manipulating uh, powers and sets and um, I, I think that is a good thing and I think it's a bad thing I think it's a good thing um, because if you're trying to apply only like sort of the classic uh, views of the game like you know, stop, uh, you will do okay. You won't be horrible. You'll be better than any new player. That's a given. But you're not guaranteed to just sort of overcome. The coolness that I feel in the, the current game state is that while one can be offensively minded, uh, you can also have a mild defensive uh, options that can disrupt your opponent's uh, target process. Things that they want to target first, they're least likely to target uh, because, you know, it has shape change or super senses or stuff like that. So overall, I, I feel like the those are the current top powers. Uh, so, yeah. All right. So let's go ahead. Uh, and go to the next question. Uh, favorite and least favorite color power and why? Uh, I 
uh, I, I would say my favorite definitely uh, is prop. Uh, actually, I take that back. My favorite is favorite is support, but I think that's more because how it was ingrained in in me after playing uh, certain people. Uh, the my my least favorite right now. I know this sounds weird uh, considering everything that uh, I said is plasticity. Uh, I I feel that plasticity needs to be fully fleshed out and you know uh, and and there's some things that need to be just dealt with on the power uh so <clears throat> so that's my thought uh yeah uh over the years uh how many color powers changed I'll I'll be honest just about every power has changed um except sidestep well no like i think all the powers technically have changed uh over the years uh but anyway um which is your favorite and least favorite of these changes over the years uh i think my least favorite and i understand why they did it was the reducing of tk uh from 10 uh spaces down to eight uh, because it's set up for the reduction from 8 to 6. And I know a lot of you will say, like, well, what's so bad? I mean, like, why is that a bad thing? Like, it, TK is a lot more balanced because, you know, you can't TK out 10. And where I would argue is you couldn't... It, it's, it's, it's like this. You can sell me a... A spaceship after you taken away my ability to fly through space on my own and with that you can sell me hyper taxis if you take away my ability to move out on my own uh, the maps that were being introduced at the time that they went from 10 to 8 really weren't allowing you many chances to TK out 10 and 8 squares. Uh, a lot of them were a lot more compact trying to hyperinflate the map uh, distance by making like S's in a lot of crude rooms that you would have to go through before you would engage. Which, I would argue, from an entertainment standpoint, is, a, is not a bad idea. It, it really isn't. Um... Uh, but to some extent, they were trying to slow the game down. And I find that interesting just mainly because, you know, the rule of three you would think would help manage that. And it really, really hasn't. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so that, that was like my, my least favorite change. Uh, my favorite change... Oh, man. Now, this one's going to also sound bad because it's a nerf. And considering I just said I didn't like the nerf of a previous power. But my favorite change um, was... <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, when they they changed hypersonic speed. So that... Uh, well, there's, there's two changes, actually. Uh, hypersonic speed didn't automatically break away. Um, I know that's more recent. And the other is uh, when they made it half your range. Uh, a lot of people never played in that era of full range hypersonic speed. And, buddy, it made hypersonic speed the power. Like, for the longest time, people complained about hypersonic speed just dominating uh, tournaments and games because... It literally is the best option. Like, there's no ends, ifs, or buts about it. It is the best option. Um, trying to pretend otherwise was naive. Um, so, when I look at, you know, the the best nerfs that happen to the game, I would say, like, hypertonic speed getting nerfed is, is right up there. 
uh, and it's one that we we definitely have to sort of keep in mind like the game is a lot more functional and a lot more balanced because hypersonic speed got nerfed i think if you're naive to that uh you wouldn't be aware of how more broken the game would be right now um if they never touch hypersonic speed and, and, and i'm not going to be hyperbolic i'm not going to say the game wouldn't exist but i i think like there would be a lot more checks and balances on design making a lot of figures uh, a lot less stat stat robust because they have hypersonic speed and range so all right um next up which is your favorite and least favorite combo of color powers and why uh favorite combo right now has been uh shape change super senses just because i'm a defensive player uh but also from just an overall player my my least favorite to deal with is the shape change super senses so there you go <laughs> I won't lie, uh, Vulture is making me not like Charge Flurry, but uh, it's not horrible. You know, it's, it's definitely not horrible. All right. Uh, next up, uh, which color power still need fixing and why? I think Leap Climb needs to have a defined purpose of why am I doing it other than punching people on different level of ele elevation. Um, there, there has to be um, an advantage. Even if it is you're able to have improved targeting, ignores elevation, uh, but you're minus one damage. Um, I think that would actually be a a good option if you're going to do a, if you're going to do a ranged or a melee. You're my, if you're going to do a range, you're minus one damage. If you're going to do melee, you're fine. I, I think that it it would open it up a little bit, and or even just saying you can't modify your damage. Uh, so the guy's like, I'm going to jump up. I jump up real high. I see a bunch of things. I'm going to throw this rock at you. Like, I can't get a, a clean shot at you, but I'm going to shoot you. At least by making it saying, like, all right, you can't get any modifiers. Like, your damage can't be modified when you use Leap Climb this way. I think it would give Leap Climb a degree of utility uh, that people will want to look at using Leap Climb uh, versus everybody's just like, oh, it's Leap Climb. Uh, it, it needs to do something else like Hulk, uh, Starter Hulk, for it to be good. Uh, but yeah, Leap Climb. Which color powers do you still see other players misuse or don't understand how they work? I, I think at this stage of the game, uh, I don't think it's so much in basic powers. I just think it's in WizKids' writing of, of their more advanced powers that, unless you're up on the current ruling, uh, most people don't know how it works. But if I had to pick one, it would be Stealth. Because uh, folks will be like, I'm right next to you, so I should be able to outwit you. I mean, that's the most common one. And, and we all know and, and have seen and experienced that. Uh, what is your favorite color in real life choice? Only Choose only one. Uh, now, if that color is in the game, what power do you have? Uh, my favorite color is blue. Uh, and so I guess at this stage, uh, I would have... Hmm, I... I wouldn't be light blue. I, I wouldn't say shape change. I definitely wouldn't have shape change. Uh, I guess I'm a mastermind. Because uh, I'm not psychic blasting anybody. And I, I definitely don't have plasticity. Unless you want to say my lovely voice keeps you contained. So uh, I guess I'm a mastermind. Uh, I count my money before I go to war. <laughs> you know... Uh, I, I'm a Nas fan, uh, so yeah. If, if you go listen to that song, uh, uh, Nas Mastermind, it's it's a brilliant song. Uh, 
and and I would recommend everyone that is uh, any sort of tactician to listen to that song. I, I had to like remove myself from that song uh, at a point in time in my younger years because I was too much like that song, uh, except uh, the whole drug thing. Not not never been in a drug game, um, but the mindset I was I was on it. All right. Uh, which color powers are under or overused by players? I, I would just definitely say that it's perplex. Uh, that's why I like the new Mr. Terrific right now. Uh, it, again, stat modification is so much of an advantage in this game that the rule of three, I say, stops this game from going off the rails. But at the same time, um, there's elements in game design that I feel that are completely naive uh, to the damage values and the attack values that they're handing out in, in respect to the average clicks of life. And I think that's a problem. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, sometimes on the dial, it's hard to tell which color is which. What color do you usually mistake? Uh, mistakenly think it's another color. I, I've done all of them. I won't front. Like, thank God for uh, for cards, because you get a bad print job, and you're just like, that's oh, that's that's impervious, and there's like, no, that's toughness, and you're like, what? Oh, okay. Uh, how can WizKids improve the color on the dial so it's easier for players to tell them apart? Uh, whatever they use for Secret Wars, just never do that crap again. Just don't. That that one's simple. Uh, if uh, possible, what new color should WizKids introduce and what would it be? I think someone has talked about it. I don't, I don't think it's functional to introduce a new color without it being close enough to another color. Uh, and so that's that's the problem that I personally see right now. Uh, because I don't see how you go from red to dark red, uh, because that would be one that you, you could try to do, uh, but it wouldn't be distinct enough. Uh, just like you could say the closest relative to orange would be pink, uh, with the pink powers. And so you're, you're sort of going on this gradient of red, orange, pink. Uh, and so you, you have a problem because we already have blue, blue and, and, we have dark and light blue, uh, and we have dark and light green, and we have black, and functionally to another degree, we have white. Um, we also have gray, and you can't do any more strat strat stratifications of gray. So, with the current colors that we have, I don't think it's possible for us to introduce another color without more color confusion uh, being introduced. And so... Uh, yeah, like even if you try to do a neon or pastel, uh, tint, I don't think you could constantly produce that so that people wouldn't get confused. All right. Uh, then, um, he asked me, uh, if, uh, WizKids made a new color power, what color would it be and what for powers? would go with that color. Uh, I, I don't know about on that color element so far, uh, but I would argue that right now, if if there were four powers that I, I would have, uh, the first would be uh, on, on movement, I would call it uh, retaliation. And it just says if a friendly character that was adjacent was attacked by an opposing character, uh, take a free action and you can attack that character this turn, but only as this free action. So you, you can't just like pop off twice on somebody. Okay. So I, I would do that. Uh, you wouldn't be able to do it for yourself. And I would actually have a pretty decent cost on that power. Uh, for attack power, I would do something uh, like uh, Weapons Master. Um, 
this uh, this character can't be targeted by uh, attack powers. Just just straight up, straight up, like you can't be targeted by attack powers. Uh, I know that sounds like really like over, you know, like overly protective, and I would definitely hand it out sparingly. Um, but I think that you could either do that or you would be able to place a piece of special terrain on the map uh, within range and line of fire if an opposing character uh, moves through that square, pick one, uh, minus one attack, minus one damage, uh, or uh, minus one defense. And it, so you can't do minus one movement because you create like a legal action type thing and you already have Henry terrain. And I don't want it to be like, yeah, free damage. Um, so by forcing people to, you know, sort of charge into your trap, you're like, haha, I'm ready for you. Uh, defensive power, uh, defensive power, I, I would do something uh, where uh, if you missed, uh, you get to automatic, that, that figure automatically breaks away and moves two squares. <laughs> I, I just think that that would be balanced. Uh, now, I know some of you would say, but, you know, Dark Logos, like, they don't have anything else to protect them. And I'm like, well, yeah, like, you could put that shape change on you. Uh, but that's about it. Uh, so I, I think that that would be an interesting, at least, concept to test. I would like to see tested. Uh, for damage power... I, I would, again, I would want it to be like sort of this anti thing is, uh, if the, if targeted, uh, if targeting or targeted by a character, uh, that has used, uh, perplex or outwit since, uh, your last turn, uh, you know, increase, uh, your, uh, I would say maybe, maybe increase your damage by one or um, make it so that like maybe your damage is uh, minimum one or something like that. I don't know. So those those are my ideas I wouldn't I would argue they're probably not the best ideas that a lot of stuff would have to be uh, looked at. I, I still like the trap idea uh, for people to put out traps. Uh, I think that that would create a a more interesting game, but uh, that's that's just my two cents. All right, so with the time left, let's talk about rebirth. Yeah, you got thirty minutes. All right, and uh, I think it's going to be amusing because you're. I mean, you're used to me complaining by now, uh, but I've done some thinking since I've had time on the show, uh, and unfortunately, my recording time and production was a lot longer dealing with Tom. Uh, also, thank you for everybody that told me, like, hey, Mr. Terrific is unique. Uh, again, Realms does not necessarily tell me if that figure is unique or not uh, with the player review thing, with a dial review. So uh, that is sort of the setback that I have uh, with using Realms uh, on the uh, preview section. So <clears throat> let's let's start breaking down some of the things that I see and some of the things I'm really concerned about. Well, let's start with what I'm concerned about since I've already went there. Number one, the biggest thing I'm concerned about is this five, five clicks of life and even introducing more of a four click of life. And I think they're sort of trying to see how the game goes with that by, by making those characters a lot more stacked, a lot more compact, constantly having powers on every click plus traits. So they're making, they're trying to say like, look, we're going to try to make you a little bit more fragile, a lot more robust. Let's see what happens. Uh, I would say that where where things sort of went off the rails was uh, Mr. Terrific and Mr. Oz. And they, they're on the, uh, or Mr. Terrific Ellie, they're on the higher end of you really got touched by the rainbow magic stick. Uh, and then... On the other end, in terms of 
like, oh my gosh, what the heck? Uh, you have characters, you know, like Jericho, who is five clicks deep for 60 points. Like, why am I playing him? Um, I think there's like a Rose Wilson. She sucks. Kid Flash. He's like four clicks. Uh, you know, Commander Steel. Like, he's four clicks. Like, there's there's a bunch of characters that if you just keep rolling through, these are they're just four click characters. Now, I know someone would say it's like, but there's multi. Are you counting multi dial characters? I am not counting multi dial characters. I always look at the multi dial characters as all right, that's the cost you're paying if you're really trying to shove that in there. Okay, so I accept the the, the final cost of, of multi-dial characters as your cost of doing business. And I think anybody that's that's not doing that is naive. So the, the frustrations that I mainly am coming to is that the game is not set up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cold plus allergies equals not fun. Uh, the The problem that I have is there are a lot of elements in the game that allows for these short dial characters that are supposed to be like engaging frontline combat characters to be one shotted, and that's just poor design. Now, if you're going to give these characters nice ranges where they can be relatively safe, then that makes sense to me. But if you're going to make them short dialed and functionally really easy to kill, um, then, then you have a problem. And, I, and I've said this before when the dials went down to the six click average. And I said, look, this is not good. If the game doesn't reevaluate how it does damage, and and how we are looking at damage, so when you're looking at two in the game, two damage being the at like two point five to three, being the average game, uh, average damage in the game early, early on in the game, and high end damage is four damage, and you have like very few fives. You know, like characters like Thanos and Galactus had, you know, fives. And you know, I think Galactus has sixes, like classic Galactus. Though those types of characters were super rare; they were on the high end. But the average character that you were engaging with was dealing somewhere between two and three damage. But you had these long clicks of life. Well, then, okay, you have more of a slugfest, which is fine. It's more of a comic book type interaction. But when you start raising defense values which sort of happen during the uh i call it the whiz kids enters um feet cards era uh you lower the attack you raise the defense and you sort of plateau out the damage so that everybody can sort of break through has a chance to break through impervious then the game becomes long uh mainly because most people aren't hitting and you're not giving out a lot of cheap stat modification so now the game is around all right who has the better attack values who has the decent attack uh, damage values are they mobile can they do they sync well with feats this that and the other which again hyper limits your game and to some degree it it was bad uh but not as bad as it could have been <laughs> i'll sort of say that right now and um I made an argument uh, on the old WizKids forums back in the day that we should have abilities that go on characters. So if I run a Thor, like I buy a pack of cards and it just says, Thor, you get to do add this for five points. Or you get to have this ability for 10 or this ability for 20. You have to pick one. Like I think if I'm able to slap that on any Thor, then... It allows you to sort of patch characters, upgrade characters that weren't that good, make people play characters that they weren't playing before, so you have some value. Uh, but that never happened. I never worked for WizKids, so yeah. I think probably for the betterment of both of us in the long term. So when when we come back, sort of, you know, cleaning, cleaning house, and we look at, you know, 
the early days of cards, most of those characters were completely underpowered because WizKids was still trying to figure this whole card thing out. Okay. Then uh, you really go into Crisis of Infinite Earths where you start seeing high attack, high damage output, high defense. And everybody really didn't so much care about the high damage output in the high attacks or higher attacks, primarily because you were getting characters that were still seven, eight clicks deep. You were fighting anti-monitor on a consistent basis. There was a, a lot of things uh, for a person to consider uh, during that period of time. But I think our changes that make the games a little bit more uh, frustrating currently uh, is I, I would say Civil War OP because Civil War really I, I rephrase that the combination of Joker's Wild and Civil War OP because I think those two things were the game saying hey look we're going to try to rein in attack. We're going to try to rein in defense because, you know, we learned our lesson from War of Light that we shouldn't be handing out 20s. Okay, just straight up, we shouldn't be handing out base 20s. At least I hope WizKid still is, hold, is holding on to that lesson because um, who knows with Black Panther and Illuminati, I could be eating these words real quick. Wouldn't be the first time. Okay, so... Uh, with no 20s and 10 attacks, uh, you are, you're, you're like, okay, things should be getting better, but you're handing out a lot of four damage and you can't pretend outwit doesn't exist. And so when you're handing out a lot of four damage and even though the attacks are lower and you're talking about doing this with super strength. The potential for one shots without perplex is immediately introduced. Now, again, you could say we have ultra heavies and all the other stuff, and then we're starting to see the ultra heavies faded out. Again, it's one of those stat manipulation elements uh, to try to make it so that a, a person can cannot just easily. Uh, I, let me phrase that. The removal of Ultra Heavies makes it so that a person cannot cap their damage without investment in Perplex, which is fine. Okay. And now you're seeing, again, these high damage outputs paired uh, with low defenses and shallow dials. And it, it, it can accelerate the game, but it completely um, stratifies even more severely uh, the has and has nots on damage output. And so you could say like the nerf of hypersonic speed and super strength working together is there to help alleviate that. Um, but like I said on the previous uh, podcast years ago when the rules got redone is... No, you just made super strength dumber with hypersonic speed uh, because now I can just knock you back and I can control where you go. And so before I had to possibly hope to roll doubles to knock you to where I want you to go. Now, I'm, I'm if you don't have knockback protection, I am guaranteed to know where I'm going to knock you back to. And I can set you up. Uh, to be attacked by any other person on my team. So anyway, but with the shorter dial problem, you, you have the increase of the one shot. You have the, the increase of risk by the player if they play any of these four or five standard, uh, sorry, four to five standard click characters. And I think the, the biggest problem that comes in is the, the four to five click characters that have stop clicks in there, like Isaac, will be exponentially more valuable and looked at as technically like a, a two-tap character, because that's what they are. Uh, then, and, and because of that, uh, of, of that sort of frustration, they, they become the zenith of, you know, that point value. 
And so my viewpoint right now is, all right, WizKids, you're trying to do something interesting between that 55 points to 80 point area. I get you. I feel you, boo. I feel you. But your the short click of life thing is not a good idea if that's where you're going the way that you're doing it. You need to make these characters rangy characters or really better supporty characters than your 50 points and below characters. Okay, I need to start seeing some broken stuff. I mean, because Mr. Terrific, I mean, not Mr. Terrific, Mr. Oz does way too much for his point value. He should be doing one of the things that he does, not all of the things that he does. Okay, Superman TA and Prob, and that doesn't require a line of fire. Okay, cool. Uh, but the TK thing, no, not at 40 points. Understand, you're selling boosters, he's in that super rare spot. But that's something that you should see on a 65, 70 point piece. Okay, if you're going to do this four click thing. All right, because for me, you're presenting a threat, or, or let me rephrase that, a control that can detrimentally hurt my team. And so, of course, I want to eliminate that threat as soon as possible. And making that threat hardy creates a ton of problems uh, for the long-term gamescape, okay? So making it a little soft, that, that makes sense. But if, if I'm investing a low amount of points into these like four click pieces then they shouldn't be in the the 50s and they shouldn't be above 50 points they they should be 50 points or lower easy to kill easy support stuff and they shouldn't be attackers they just shouldn't be attackers and and if they are attackers you need to really make their defense values more stout for for their point costs and I think that's that's one huge problem that goes down is that most of these figures aren't really designed to engage. They're designed to, yeah, they're not designed well to engage. So let's 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 go look at one of these uh, prime examples. So we got number thirty-one, Batman. All right, so he has leading the charge. When Batman makes uh, the first attack during a turn and hits until your next turn, just lead character keyword has protected outwit, which is cool. All right, yeah, he does that. Lines of fire drawn to Batman are blocked unless lines of fire crosses only unoccupied squares. So you give him protection against, you know, improved targeting or his hindering. All right, because it's not stealth. And, and again, maybe I'm wrong on that one, but let's just say for right now I am. All right, he has Leap Charge and Leap Climbs on a special power. When Batman breaks away, you may choose an opposing character he broke away from. Uh, if you do, after resolutions, place that character up to two squares away uh, within line of fire from his current square. All right, great. So I'm able to uh, maneuver you. Okay. Now, let's, let's look at Batman. He's a 17D. What, what, he, he's a 17D. Now I need to keep Batman inside of hindering so that he's a 19 because of combat reflexes. And he has a five range. So at his five range, if he is going to engage, he's going to be really, really close. Unless you're investing a lot of stat modification into Batman. If we're also looking at the way this character is designed, he's designed to go with Justice League. And is he really suitable for most Justice League teams? And the answer is realistically no. Okay. Even if you want to try to say that he is a bit more of the muscle on the just, I mean, or trying to be a little bit more muscly with the 11 attack and the end cap, or even trying to provide a control, he's still a bit frustratingly fragile. All right. So... You're functionally putting him in the middle of a lot of hindering instead of just putting him like on the edge. And then it's like, okay, like if they're right in front of me, the line of fire will go through hindering. So I'm protected. You know, he really needs to be in hindering 
uh, and, and just chilling there, which limits him some more. But, uh, but again, once he's hit by most standard attacks, he's dead. And I've invested 85 points. That's a lot. That's that is a whole lot uh, to consider. That I've I've I can as a player easily delete off a third, uh, almost a third of your build, just because you know I have stat mods. Uh, and I know it's easy to say, well, the, the Dark Logos, that's the way the game is. You know, if you have stat mods, that just happens. Fine, but if he's one more click deeper, he's pretty much guaranteed to survive like mo he, he's able to take at least two hits um on average on average but he can still be one shot but he you know he, the person has to invest a lot more unless they're a super strength character uh if we go further down i know i think it might be down or up there was like a Okay, here we go. Adriana Tomas. Yeah, she um, she's easily not that good. And again, that 65 points, 5 clicks of life, just going to get punked. Uh, her range is crap. And you have TK and RCE. And those things inflate her call. Like, the TK, I understand... But the RC just inflates her cost and make, makes it not worth it. Like, drop the RC, put her at 50 points, and now she's sort of viable. Or drop the RC, give her a perplex that she can only use on herself or something, and, and now she's a little bit more viable. You know, or, I mean, if you don't have a six range... Why am I going to use that? Now, I, I'm saying all of this not to just be like, I'm pad to show. But I'm, I'm saying all of this primarily because I feel that WizKids should start looking at making more of the characters viable for play. And, and not just saying, hey, here you go. There's this, there's this one thing. That makes it all stupid. Now buy this. It's super rare, guys. You know, and I, I don't mind that if there's things that are of high rarity that are good. That's fine. But if I'm looking at my super rares, and I'm looking at most of them, and I'm like, these are trash. Or I'm looking at most of my rares, and I'm looking, and I'm saying, like, these are trash. There's a problem. All right. So let's, let's go look at something that's really close to being right when we start looking at that uh now i let me phrase that let's look at a character that's actually designed well and that's raven okay why is raven designed well number one she has two point values which i feel in the future if you're going to go down this route with these low point guys give them a decent range and then sort of play with the two dial thing a little bit more. And I think WizKids really needs to do a little bit more research and effort in the dual dial thing than they are with, okay, this guy's sort of crap. So we're going to have him at 50 points or 35, or 50 points or 65 points. You need to be like, all right, here's your 65 point dial. Here's your 30 point dial. This is his character at the best we saw him. And this is the character on average of what we saw him. All right, there you go. Have fun with that. Okay. So, uh, let's look at Raven. Why is she good? She has a okay trait that makes her specific to a certain type of matchup. All right. So, that, that actually helps you fill out a certain theme. Then, she has the special power that gives her phasing teleport and passenger. So, she's also a taxi. All right. Can she get super far? Not really, but she can get a decent, uh, you know, a, she can get to decent places, okay? All right. And she can also carry flyers. Uh, uh, so that is also great, but she's limited to things that share her keyword. 
All right. Uh, then she has perplex probability control and support. So that's a really good trifecta of support powers right there. Her damage output is low. Uh, she has uh, psychic blast on her low dial in and she has regen and stealth and outwit on her last two clicks, which you're not guaranteed to do. She has mystics and team Titans. All right. This is all in a rare. So my, my question comes back. You have a, a rare that's designed really well. Uh, and then you have a bunch of other characters at lower and higher rarities that aren't designed as well as this figure. So, of course, a lot of people are going to gravitate to this figure. Why? Is it just because it's good? Well, yes, because it's good, but also it's designed well. This figure isn't going to be Kamehameha blasting people, you know, off the map unless they're pogs. So where is the, the role of this character? This, the, the role of this character is very specific. We know what this, this character is going to do. And I understand that they have that specific and generalist mindset in, in team design, I mean, figure in dial design, and that's fine. But if you're going to say, like, I'm going to have generalists and uh, these generalists are, their whole job is to have all these options, then at least try to make it so that the option combinations are desirable. Don't just be like, you know, Adriana Tomaz, where it's like range combat expert in TK. That's, a, that's an expensive opening click. That's a hell of an expensive opening click. And you're going to give me crap range. So, yeah, that's that's a problem. Uh, my, my next problem with Rebirth is I feel that WizKids, when they design the set, they are not looking at a two-year block. What I fear is that they're getting uh, promos from uh, Marvel or DC. And they're saying, look, this is the stuff that we have lined out for the next two years. Hush, hush on this stuff. Don't say anything. We want these products to line up with... Uh, with these releases or at least after these releases and WizKids is aware of some of it sometimes i don't think they're aware of all of it there's some things that they want to do because they're like oh yeah that would be cool you know uh and so i'm fine with that all right now when we look at the designing process there are many times where i've said Oh, this is a signal that we're going to see depowering. And then after that signal is sort of sent out there into the universe, WizKids then is like, nah, man, that's not happening. That's not happening at all. We're we're gonna create we're gonna make this super steroid set and it's going to be killer. And you're you're stuck sort of scratching your head and you're like all right, all right, hold on wait 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 i thought we were depowering and moving away from x y and z uh, 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 mechanics but then you're going to come back and you're going to reintroduce y and and x even though z was countering x you're not reintroducing z then introduce a and j and then we're like okay cool all right uh, so we're going to go for a little while longer Then we have J and X and Y. For some reason, A disappears for a bit. And then we come, you know, a little bit further. Uh, J has run its course. We're back to X and Y, you know, and Z. And, and everybody's celebrating because Z is back. And then we're, we're sitting there. It's like, man, this, this doesn't feel new. Or this doesn't feel fresh. And then all of a sudden they get rid of X, Y, and Z. And they introduce N, uh, O, and Q. And, and and then everybody's like, yeah, N, O, and Q, yeah. 
And, and so there, there isn't a comprehensive flow. Like it should be, I introduce A, B, C. Once that we look at what's not working, let's just say A is not working or A is giving us negative feedback. We're going to go to, you know, uh, B, C, and D. Okay, so D is there to counteract A, try to flush A out the system. Now, once D is done, we go into EFG because now we're able to move the player base onward past those first set of mechanics into what we think now is good. All right, and, and you just repeat the process, but it requires you to have sort of like a long scale out design and then being able to interject certain figures here and there or tweak certain figures here and there where thematically appropriate to start repairing some of the damage done by previous sets. And it's not there. I, I could say it's better than what it used to be, but you cannot, and I'm saying this specifically, you can't put me on Joker's Wild and then reduce, I'm sorry, and then release the Mighty Thor. Okay. You you really can't. And I know some folks will say, well, Edward, that's an old example. And I'm like, all right, follow with me. Okay. So then you go from the Mighty Thor to Harley Quinn, which is functionally on the same level as Joker's Wild. So why am I buying that? And even in my personal collection, I don't have a lot of Harley Quinn. And you go back to my review, I said the, re the set is crap. Because it is. Then you up that low point value in X-Men uh, Xavier School. And so again, you get again this power spike, this very strong power spike of low to mid cost of figures that just whoop butt. Okay, and you, you sort of stay on that trend with uh, Avengers Infinity. All right, so if I compare Avengers Infinity, Xavier School, and the Mighty Thor to, you know, Harley Quinn into Joker's Wild, it's just a joke. Now, no, I, I'm sort of glossing over Elseworlds and What If because those were mainly trash and we know it. We, we hate to admit it, but it was trash. All right, you move forward and you look at Turtles and Turtles is sort of neutral. You get Batman the Animated Series and everybody is happy. Why? We got completely new mechanics. DC got their own objects. Okay, we see the influx of Autonomous. So that's like, oh, oh snap, that's hot. Okay, so again, you go from ABC and then we we int introduce D, you know, we introduce D, and D's jo job is to for us to start thinking differently about A and removing A out of the mix. But see, that didn't happen. But we just got, it went A, B, C, D. Here's autonomous. Autonomous is D. Okay. And then you're like, all right, well, well okay, DC got their, their goodness back. And then you have... Uh, Secret Wars Battle World. And again, you have this sort of almost everywhere spike, mainly because of the perplexes. Mainly because of the perplexes. Now, you could say Earth X was uh, a little bit calm the hell down, which it was, but it wasn't Harley and, and um, Joker's Wild level calm the hell down. Okay. And then we go to Rebirth and we see this fall off again. And I'm, I'm skipping over Captain Marvel because, again, that's a box set primarily. So, we, we start asking ourselves some serious questions. If I'm looking at Joker's Wild all the way up to Rebirth, where is the game going? Give me a roadmap. Like, what do y'all think the roadmap is? And I'm going to be honest. We have no freaking clue. We don't. Is it cheap guys and more characters on team and very few OMAs? No. Not at all. Okay. Is is it uh, high defense 
and uh, a lot of positioning for one big strike. No, that game has hasn't been hero clicks for for years. Okay, I, I would make that argument that it hasn't been that game since Patrick Yapoko's first uh, championship. Okay, uh, you take it even further and you ask yourself, all right. Where is it trying to play little microcosms of functional comic accurate teams? And that's the closest that I can see it. That is literally the closest that I can see it. More than any other time in history, you are actually seeing people play like close to lineups. And I never, like if you talked to me 10 years ago and, and you told me that Avengers would be one of the most dominating keywords out there, I would have said, put the crack pipe down and get some help. Get some help. All right. You know, it's that, that Michael Jordan mean. It's like, stop it. Stop it. Okay. But functionally, we have seen the rise of Avengers to be a competitive team. And it's not just Hawkeye. Now we can make the argument about Hulk and is Hulk just doing the same thing Hawkeye's doing? That's fair. But it's not just Hawkeye. All right. You're a just because of the point cost, you're able to fit these multitude of different characters on the team. So... Without a clear vision of where the game is going, I think game design is like, oh, that's cool, so let's introduce that. Oh, we have this problem, so instead of you know banning the figure, we're going to introduce this. We're going to make it a little bit better to make people incentivized to play this, so it by effect will gradually fade out this other thing. You know, those are the things that I see, and. If I looked at any other game that I've played, that's not the case. Now, I will agree uh, with Jason Collins from Married With Clicks when he said, in game design, you can't see everything and the player is always going to do something that you didn't expect. I am fully willing to admit that, that game design is not omniscient. But there are some blindingly obvious things. It's like, you know, we shouldn't do that. You know, like we really prop, we really shouldn't be doing this. Uh, so, anyway, I guess I'm just saying this mainly as a player, a vet player, and not a vet designer. And I guess that puts me at odds with a, a lot of stuff. And I know if if someone's going to ask like Dark Logos, what would you do if you were in charge of Wizkids right now? What would you do going forward since you're you're bringing up all the gripes? What's what would you do? Like, realistically, I would have plans for after retirement. And and I would say, all right, cool. We're getting rid of these. Li Once retirement happens, we know this list of mechanics is gone. Okay? Just all of these mechanics are gone. We don't have to worry about them anymore. Let's look at these lists of mechanics and ask ourselves, what did players gravitate to? Why did players like these mechanics? Why did players hate these mechanics? Why did we see these mechanics place well in our major events? You know, you, you have enough player outsourcing of your information for your WKOs that realistically, you can find out what people are playing and why. And if you want to take a step forward, you have emails on a lot of these sheets. If you see an email... Just be like, hey, this is WizKids technical support. We were at one to know a couple of things. We saw that you placed top four at one of our events. And you just give them a blank questionnaire. And I will tell you, in a hot New York minute, every person that got that email through their spam filter would reply to you. Every freaking single one. And they would tell you the ins and out of their team, why they did it, what what in the game made them question their decisions, the mechanics that they hated to go against, why, what they thought was cheap about it, all that stuff. You have the a full ability to get customer feedback. 
so anyway, so that that would be what I would do initially. Once I got those list of mechanics and then we got that feedback from players, I would say, look, the game can't allow for the following stuff to continue existing. And I would put it up on a blackboard. And and I would say, like, the taboos or the anathemas of hero clicks. Lessons learned from the past. Okay? And one of the first ones I would have said, do not give a player unlimited free actions. That was the lesson from uh, going all the way back uh, to War of Light era. Where you're in, in hell, even before that, going to a uh, Ghost Rider uh, meta. Do not give a player unlimited free actions. Okay? Because if you learned that lesson, we wouldn't have Hawkeye and we wouldn't have Vulture. Okay? And I brought this up, it, like, again, listen to old shows if you want to. I had Norm on the show and I told him this exact same thing. I'm like, you have a problem in this game. And the problem, and again, at that time, is that you have characters just doing too many free actions. They get a standard attack and a free attack. They're perplexing and they're outwitting. Then they're doing some other thing. All as free actions. And even though we've gotten rid of a lot of the free action tags, the same stuff is going on. The same stuff. Now, I'm not going to say Hawkeye bad, Vulture bad, just inherently. But when you start looking at Vulture and you say Vulture with equipment is bad. All right. I, as a player, should at least get two turns to do something. But if I'm able to design a team with Vulture and my game is over. I mean, my opponent's game is over in two turns. Then you have a problem. Now, again, I'm not against Rushdown. That's fine. But I should, if I know Rushdown exists, I should be able to pack options to help me deal with that. Or at least, you know, be able to fight it. But when you come back to this philosophy of low click dials, and you're trying to compact powers, and you're making characters sort of meh, you're going to create a huge stratification where you're going to see these tentpole teams just start coming back because it's the only thing to deal with them. That and, and, and hard to kill. Like it's it's a problem. And and yes, I agree I, I feel like Vulture helps you solve for pogs. Uh Hawkeye helps you solve for pogs. Uh Vulture helps you Vulture and Hawkeye help you solve for Colossal Retail, which in my opinion has gotten absurd. A lot of it has gotten absurd. But again, whiz kids will not reevaluate it because they know. Colossal Retail allows people to use more of their collection. And you cannot move big figures if they do not have a 300-point place. And it's really hard, in my opinion, for them to design viable and competitive Colossals that work in a 300-point game outside of Colossal Retaliation. And there's only a handful that have ever really been used. And you're looking at... Da, da 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 eternity and you're looking at da 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 infinity those are really the only two colossals that have shown up competitively in a 300 point game now i know someone out there is going to be like but uh hulk and thanos on cyborg no 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 okay so anyway it, we're hitting my hour, so let's let's wrap this up. Okay, what else would I do? I would put the game in blocks. I would look at our current retirement. I'm like, all right, the game is mainly shifted in this proportion. And I would just do a map. I would just do a simple, like, number grouping. This percentage of our characters are zero points to 25. This percentage of our characters are are 26 to 50. This percentage of our characters are 50 to 100. This percentage of our characters are 100 to 150. This percentage of our characters are 150 to 200. And then I would say 200 and above. Now, you're probably wondering why in that specific grouping. Zero to 25 is its own category, in my opinion, for this game. That's it's super cheap utility. 
is free free points or super cheap utility. That's or or super cheap fodder that respawns. That's it. Okay. 25 um, 26 to 50 usually means that it's functional utility. Functional utility means that you do one or two gimmicks, possibly two gimmicks, and you may attack and if you don't attack, you do probably a third gimmick. Uh 55 uh, really like 51 to to 100 you're starting looking at your second tier and third tier attackers uh being introduced and some of your second tier attackers either have really good attack prowess or they have mediocre attack prowess with some uh support ability and then from 100 to 150 you're looking at uh average or mainstay attackers or hyper supports I, I mean, like, super hyper supports, uh, like Worm, okay? Or a classic Morgan Le Fay. All right. <laughs> Got to adjust here. And then from 150 to 200, you're looking at your heavy hitters, and 200 and above, you're looking at tent poles, one-man army, stuff like that. And I would just group it. And I would just say, all right, based off this number grouping, where does a majority of the figures that we have are leaning towards. Okay, a majority of the figures that we are leaning, we have lean, are leaning towards low level point guys. And then I would peruse those guys and I say like 80% of these guys are crap. And if you start looking at uh, your 55, uh, sorry, your 51 to, to 100 and you scroll through them and you say 35 point, 35% 35 of these guys are crap. And then you start looking at, you know, your, your 100 to 150, you're like, uh, 10% of these guys are crap. And then you start realizing that the higher up in points, the better your design is getting. So I, I would come back and I'd be like, okay, cool. So we have a, do we want care, do we want people to play more comic accurate themes to, to appease the, the casual crowd? Or are we going to keep looking at what we're good at right now and then look at ways to improve what we're bad at? So I would say like, all right, let's keep it comic accurate. And I would start reevaluating. Yeah, they're, they're in my, uh, my lack of professionalism. Uh, yeah, I would then go and say like, all right, let's focus on teams. And since we're focusing on teams, I want to see three competitive options that utilize a core that requires the core use of a common or uncommon character in a very specialized and powerful use in our rare super rare uh chases uh synchronizing the whole uh rarity because i want someone to pull that common out and say this is good and then when I start, or common or uncommon, and I want them to gravitate towards somebody else in that keyword, someone else in that theme, or or even say like, all right, this is a general all-purpose figure, and I'm going to design it as such and allow it to sort of integrate into the game as such. And I think President Ricard is a good example. There needs to be more characters that just say, I am not for or break theme. But I help all themes sort of patch out some weaknesses. Sort of like Eternity. Eternity picks up all, um, all, all keywords. That's great. That is great. Uh, same with Silver Sable. You can pick up and copy keywords. I like that because you're able to flesh out some uh, mechanics that are core mechanics to this game that makes them successful. You make it up because it's an all-purpose. They're a little bit more overpriced. You're paying a little bit more of a premium, but you're not paying like the extreme premium that may uh, be in that that category, which is like your cheapest prob might be 95 points. Okay, uh, I I pay uh, 60 points, and this character doesn't break theme, and it it gives me a prob, and it does something else that's cool, or it gives me a prob, and it can sort of attack. Okay, cool. I'll pay that. I'll pay that, baby. You know, so. Those are the things that I would do if I was laying it out. And after we decided where we were, would go, I would present it to the players and just say, look, this is our roadmap. I know for people that follow video games, you're probably tired of hearing roadmaps. 
I'm gonna, I would say like, this is our roadmap for the next two years. We want to make our focus around teams um, and you playing comic accurate teams and encouraging you to play comic accurate teams. This is what we, we're getting the rules team on board. We're getting game design on board. We're doing all this. And you make it clear, it's not going to be Justice League, Avengers, X-Men, Batman Family show. Okay? It's not just going to be those teams are going to be the only teams that you are going to be able to play. And just making making it specific. Like, game design, as game design, we're looking at our, our what we want. We're even going so far to talk to freaking Steve... Talk to freaking Steve and talk with Howard about maps and what we do when we don't want in map design. And we're going to start setting up a standard template for what the types of formats of maps that we're going to start generating. Because we're going to have figures that are going to excel on some map. We want to, or teams that excel on some map. So let's just say you get uh, the Outlaws team. And they're not very mobile. They have a lot of short ranges. And they're a lot of like street brawler level type guys. Okay. And they might have one or two cannons. All right. We're going to start making. I, I, for that set, we're going to have a map which utilizes uh, a lot of close combat uh, type situations. But the, the maximum line of fire range is going to be somewhere around seven. Okay. So it allows for teams that have longer ranges not to be completely screwed, but it also gives you an advantage for running your Outlaws teams. Uh, you could say your Young Team Titans teams, your Batman Family teams, or whatever that came out in that set. Or what you're looking at having designed over a series of sets. And that's another thing. While, while characters are introduced through various sets, sort of say this, here's my dream team by the time rotation ends. I want to see Starfire, I want to see Cyborg, I want to see Nightwing, and I want to see Beast Boy. I want to, over three to, you know, after two years, I should be able to assemble this team. This team works like this. And I want players to be incentivized to play this team. Okay? Or I think that it's functional. I have a team and I have a map. And it should be competitive enough through our play testing that it should be able to take on, uh, uh, on average, it, it should have in its matchups, let's just say 35 to 40 percent, 50 50 matchups. There should be 10 to 50, uh, 10 to 25 percent where it's just overwhelmingly I win, and there should be 25 point, uh, 25 percent like you just flat lose. And you understand that players are still going to just not play theme, and that's fine too. So that's that's what I would do if I was WizKids. And, and again, Rebirth has sort of made me hella stingy. Um, I thought I was going to drop money on chases. And then I realized with the Vulture sort of zeitgeist and the Hawkeye zeitgeist that in reality... Uh, Dawn Breaker isn't worth it because most people aren't playing Pogs. Uh, Murder Machine isn't worth it because Vulture and Hawkeye are way better. And once you take away Dawn Breaker and Murder Machine, you sort of don't need most of the chases. Uh, I still open up discussion. Uh, I'm willing to open up discussion on Barbados. Uh, cause I, or Barbados. I, I think that he is... Uh, potentially shenanigany at a at hundred, but I don't have something on the plate right now. So yeah, that's today's show. Um, I like to, uh, like always thank Malcolm Rush, the man from Japan, the international man of mystery, uh, for sending me the questions and, uh, yeah. Uh, so let's, uh, start this, this outro here. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at start over pod. It came from outer space. And told me uh, that there is a Prez Ricard. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he is a uh, mollusk uh, type creature uh, on planet uh, DX394, uh, also known as the Blah planet. 
Uh, he's there, but he's not that good of a leader. Uh, but everybody likes him for some reason. I think it's because uh, of my my Twitter tells me uh, he he's able to get uh, broadcast signals from Earth. So yeah, uh, I think he's still getting stuff from like the nineteen twenties and thirties. But uh, that's why everybody likes him. I guess you know that that Mollus storytelling isn't isn't up to par quite yet. But it will be. It will be. All right, uh, so you can follow me on Twitter uh, because, you know, YouTube hates YouTubers. You can know when a new show is up and uh, all that other goodness. You also can email me at startingoverpodcast at gmail.com. That's startingoverpodcast at gmail.com. If you wish to opine, keep it pivy, keep it interesting, keep it awesome, baby. Yeah. Let me know what you think of Rebirth. Are we on the right track? Is Rebirth really bring in some bad trends uh you can also donate to the show at startingoverpodcast.blogspot.com there's a donate button there if you would like to hire my services i am coaching uh it's a uh, 15 dollars for a coaching session five dollars for a game and i know some people will say well what's the advantage of the game uh in that game we we will play um we will plan out your first few moves and critique uh, what needs to be done. All right. Uh, you can also buy a shirt, buy a Starting Over Podcast shirt below and have my lovely face uh, on your chest. Yeah, it's great. Uh, that's it. That is it. That is it for today's show. It's uh, long. I need to get breakfast and do other things. So uh need to get cleaned up. Maybe get a robe on or something these shorts it's cold outside it's freaking april and cold outside what's going on all right so uh i'd like to thank you all for listening and like always we all have to start over sometime time